slogan, as you always hear me say, before I start, grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus. As always, we always start the lesson off with uh, the reading of the law. So we're going to continue that tradition. Brother Jack Moss, if you will, start at Exodus, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 17. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord would not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Praise the Lord. I go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 through 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Yes, this is the reason why we read this, because we know that we have to keep the commands of God, because that's just as important as having faith in Jesus Christ to get to this eternal life. So we don't have any problem with telling people, yeah, you got to have the faith in Jesus Christ, but you got to keep his commandments also. Revelations 22, verse 14 through 15. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without our dogs, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, mm -hmm. and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and make it a lie. Amen, amen. Grace and peace in the name of Jesus once again. I'm Brother Jerome. This is my reader, Brother Jack Moss. We both from the Riverdale camp. And uh, the title of our lesson today is The Prayer of Solomon and Jesus. And you can get plenty of wisdom from the prayer of Solomon and Jesus. And we're going to give you a few details of some of that wisdom in this lesson today. So we're going to begin our lesson in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 6. Pick it up at verse 1. Read it to the 2. When you get there, go ahead and read. Then said Solomon, the Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. But I have built a house 
of habitation for thee and a place for thy dwelling forever. Okay, Solomon built a house for the Lord to dwell in. Keep reading, skip down to verse 12 and 13. And he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands. For Solomon had made a brazen scaffold of five cubits long and five cubits broad uh -huh. and three cubits high and had set it in the midst of the court. And upon it, he stood and kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. So he said he kneeled and spread forth his hands in prayer to this great God that we serve. And when we pray, there's two postures we could take in praying to this God. A real good way to pray to the Lord is to prostrate yourself before your God when you pray to him, or you can do it just like Solomon did it. He kneeled on his knees and he spread forth his hand in prayer to this great God, the God of Israel. Okay, read verse 14. And said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like thee mm. in the heaven nor in the earth, which keep it covenant and show it mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. He said, O Lord God of Israel, there ain't no other God. Is that true? True. That's the truth. Ain't no other gods. They got other gods that they claim. But we know that they there is no other God but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we understand that that God is Jesus. That's the one we've been dealing with from the beginning of time. And that's the one we're going to be dealing with when he returned. The God of Israel. That's who Solomon making this prayer to. Skip to verse 18, read it to the 20. But will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Mm -hmm. Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house uh -huh. which I have built. Have respect, therefore, to the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, mm -hmm. to hearken unto the cry and the prayer which thy servant prayer before thee. Mm -hmm. That thine eyes may be open upon thine house day and night upon the place whereof thou hast said that thou wouldest put thy name there mm -hmm. to hearken unto the prayer which thy servant prayer toward this place. Okay, so Solomon said that the Lord's eyes may be open upon this house and upon this place when the Lord said he going to place his name there, right? That the Lord may hearken unto the prayer of thy servant, which he make toward this place. Jerusalem is that place when the Lord said he going to put his name there. It ain't wrong. <laughs> okay. The world seek to wrong, but we seek to the Lord God of Israel and he said he placed his name not in Rome. He placed his name in Jerusalem. Okay? Skip up to verse 6. Go ahead. But I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there and have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Uh-huh. Now, by the time Solomon built this house for the Lord to dwell in, David had already passed away. But what I want to draw your attention to is when he said Jerusalem is the place that I'm going to place my name. Okay, I want to draw your attention to that. Let's connect that with Psalms. I'm going to use several places to make this connection. Let's go to Psalms 132. And we're going to read verse 11 through 14. See if I can turn the pages quicker than you all can. Hmm. I got my phone up here too, just in case I'm turning my pages kind of slow. I'm doing all right thus far. Psalms 132, verse 11 through 14. 
When you get there, go ahead and read. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. Go ahead. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. That's a great uh, offer the Lord is making to us. Yeah. To those that take heed and take hold of his covenant, he promising you his throne. It, it's power that come with that throne. Okay. Unimaginable power. You know, mm -hmm. that's why he was trying to give you this, this, this power way back in Genesis. You know, from the foundation of the world, he was trying to give you this power. Right? right? Because he said, I created you and I gave you dominion over the, all the works of my hands. Now, if you're going to have dominion all over all the works of God's hands, you got to have some power. Okay? So he was trying to give you that power way back in Genesis. Okay? Mm -hmm. But keep reading. What verse were you? Verse 13. Verse 13, keep reading. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. Uh huh. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. Okay, so the Lord, he in heaven right now. But when he return, he's going to set up and dwell in Zion. And Zion is Jerusalem. Okay, that's the reason why he chose Zion to place his name there. One of the reasons is because he's going to dwell there forever. But he in heaven right now, so he got to come down here to dwell there forever because Jerusalem is on this earth. Okay? And he's going to set up in Jerusalem. And as we continue in this lesson, he's going to dwell in the midst of his people, even the children of Israel. Right there in Jerusalem. And he's going to be there forever. Okay? Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3. Let's see what Jeremiah know about it. Pick it up at verse 12, read it to the 14. Give him a minute. Am I going too fast? Okay. All right. Just let me know if I am. I'm easy to work with. <laughs> Jeremiah 3, pick it up at verse 12 and read it to the 14. Go ahead. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, uh -huh. said the Lord, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, said the Lord. Yeah. And I will not keep anger forever. Go ahead. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God mm -hmm. and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, said the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, said the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city uh -huh. and two of a family, uh -huh. and will bring you to Zion. Yeah, because we scattered all over the globe, aren't we? The children of Israel is anyway. Yeah. Right? He said, but I'm going to take you one of a city, two of a family, and I will return you to Zion. Okay? Now, we know that there's 12 tribes, right? But you got three tribes that dwell in Jerusalem, which is Zion. Right? Yeah. And then all the rest of the country of Israel is where the other tribes going to dwell. Okay? So when he said, I'm going to return you to Zion, he's talking to the Jews, okay? The ones that make up the uh, banner of Judah, which is Benjamin, Levi, and Judah, okay? But uh, just understand, I want you to continue to read verse 15 through 17. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart. That's what I want you to understand. <laughs> I'm going to give you pastors according to my heart because we got too many imposters out here claiming to be pastors. Okay? And they're misleading all of the people. 
Okay. Lord said, I'm going to give you passes according to my heart, according to my mind. Go ahead. Which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Come on, because they ain't feeding us with no knowledge and understanding now, are they? Nope. You know, I didn't start getting no knowledge and understanding. I'm just going to be honest until I came to the Israel, the Israel of God. And the reason why I put the D on there, because they got other churches out here that's taking on that name, Israel of God, and they ain't us. And they still giving you polluted doctrine. Yeah. So make sure when you invite your friends and your family, make sure you put the D on there. <laughs> okay. Keep reading. You at verse what? 16. Go ahead. And it shall come to pass when you be multiplied, and increased in the land, in those days, said the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Stop right there. Don't they brag a whole lot these days about the ark of the covenant and who got it? Yeah. You hear that all the time, right? Yeah. yeah. The, the, the Ethiopians got it. But I remember reading about them Philistines that had control of that ark. And what happened to them Philistines? The Lord was destroying them by the truckload. And after a while, they said, we got to get this ark away from us. Mm -hmm. Because the God of this ark is killing us. Okay? But the Ethiopians got it. But you don't hear nothing about how they being slayed by the truckload. Because they ain't got no ark of the covenant. That's why. Okay? <laughs> But pick that up again at the beginning, 17. 16. I mean, 16. Go ahead. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. Mm -hmm. In those days, said the Lord, they shall say no more. The ark of the covenant of the Lord, uh -huh. neither shall it come to mind. Uh -huh. Neither shall they remember it. Neither shall they visit it. Neither shall that be done anymore. Go ahead. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, mm -hmm. to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. See, by the mouth of two or more witnesses, let a thing be established. He keep telling you, I put my name in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Okay? And they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. What they call in Jerusalem now. What those of us got that got some understanding, they call in Jerusalem a cup of trembling right now. <laughs> okay? Because they slaying each other. Yep. Mm -hmm. The Lord ain't there. Okay? But there's an appointed time where he will return to Zion, which is Jerusalem. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1, read it to the 4. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1, and read it to 4. Give him a minute. I hear some pages. Okay, go ahead. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah... In Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days. In the last days, we talking about the last days now. Even though you're reading about it in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, we talking about what's to take place in the last days. Go ahead. That the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains, mm -hmm. and shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow unto it. All nations going to flow unto the mountain of God. The mountain of God and other places let you know that's Jerusalem. Go ahead. And many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us, teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So in the last days when the Lord returned to dwell in Jerusalem and the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, the nations are going to turn their weapons 
into farming equipment. And the reason why they're going to turn their weapons into farming equipment, equipment, because when the Lord come back, he got some work to do before he go back home to Jerusalem. Okay? He got to whoop down the wicked. He got to take down the nations that's controlling this earth. Okay? And when he get through with them, they ain't gonna want they ain't gonna want to learn war anymore. Okay. And let's go to First Kings chapter eight. Did you want to read four? Go ahead, go ahead and read that four. And he I shall, definitely want you to read that four. Go ahead. And he shall judge among the nations mm -hmm. and shall rebuke, rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares uh -huh. and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. So, you know, we just read the verse that proved what I'm saying to you. This is a time to come. It said in that second verse, in the last days. Okay. So we waiting on that. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 8. See what else Solomon said in his prayer. First Kings chapter eight, and we're gonna pick it up, pick it up at verse twenty-eight, and read it to the twenty-nine. Our uh, brother Jack Moss, give him a minute, give me a minute. <laughs> First Kings chapter eight, twenty-eight through twenty-nine. Okay, go ahead. Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant, and to his supplication. O Lord, my God, uh -huh. to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayed before thee today, mm -hmm. that thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, my name shall be there, yes, sir. that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. Okay, like, like I said earlier, we know that the Lord is dwelling in heaven right now, right? But he said that thy eyes may be open toward this place. So the Lord's eyes is on Jerusalem night and day, okay? And so we know he are hearkening to his servant's prayer that have understanding to play towards that place, which is Jerusalem. Verse 30. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant. Uh -huh and of thy people Israel, mm -hmm. when they shall pray toward this place. Mm -hmm. And hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place. And when thou hearest, forgive. Look like uh, Solomon keep repeating this about towards this place. Yeah. He know a little something that he trying to convey unto us. You know, pray towards Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah. He keep making that point. <laughs> It must be something to it. He keep telling, because they say Solomon, where well, the Bible says Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. And he giving you this advice. I think we should take it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Keep reading, skip down, actually skip down to verse 38 and read it to the 39. Because I want to uh, establish also Jerusalem is uh, east of America. And we're in America. That's why we pray toward the east. Okay. Now, if you're in China or Asia, you would face the west because Jerusalem is west of China and Asia. So they will face the west. Okay. So everybody on the globe don't face the east because everybody on the globe, Jerusalem is not east of every place on this planet. Okay? All right. So now skip down to verse 38 and read it to the 39. What prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spread forth his hands towards this house. Uh-huh. So he not just talking about Israel doing this now. He said Every man, I don't, I don't care what nationality you are, you do the same thing 
here that Solomon is conveying for us to do when we make our prayer to this great God, you're going to get the same acknowledgement. Because he said, hey, if we do this, will you hear our prayer? And the Lord, he'll hear your prayer. He said, I'll hear the prayer of my servants. Okay? So we hedge the bet, and we pray towards Jerusalem, don't we? Yep. Okay? Amen. All right? What verse? 39. Go ahead. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive, mm -hmm. and do, and give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest. Uh -huh. For thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all the children of men. Uh -huh. So that's, that's very important. So when we make our prayer now, pray with a heart to repent yeah. of our sins. Mm -hmm. When we come before him, have it in your heart that it's your intention to repent of, of your sins. And when the Lord look in your heart, because he look on the heart, don't he? Yeah. He don't yeah. judge according to the outward appearance, do he? No. The Lord looketh on the heart. So when he looketh on the heart, he know if you faking or not. You know, so he may hear and he may not, but hedge that bet and pray anyway. Because the day that he see that you repenting in your heart, that's when he'll forgive you. Right. We do serve a merciful God. He will forgive. He don't want to see nobody get lost. He want to save as many that want to be saved. Okay. Unfortunately, everybody don't want to be saved. That's unfortunate. Okay? Because when you eyeball the eyeball with that lake, then that's when it's going to get real important to you then. Okay? So we can play around right now. But there's coming a time. Okay? <laughs> Skip down to verse 41. Read it to the 43. Go ahead. Moreover, concerning a stranger... That is not of thy people Israel, but coming out of a far country for thy name's sake. Uh -huh. For they shall hear of thy great name and of thy strong hand and of thy stressed out arm. Uh -huh. When he shall come and pray towards this house, mm -hmm. hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all that the stranger call it to thee for. The stranger. He ain't just talking to Israel. Now is he? The stranger too. Finish that. That all people of the earth may know thy name to fear thee, as do thy people Israel. Mm -hmm. And that they may know that this house which I have built it is called by thy name. Yes, Lord. You know, so praying towards Jerusalem ain't just beneficial for the children of Israel. It's beneficial for all mankind. Yeah, that's right. All mankind. Okay. Go to verse 54. Go ahead. And it was so that when Solomon had made an end of praying all this prayer and supplication unto the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord, from kneeling on his knees mm -hmm. with his hands spread up to heaven. Uh huh. Because it, 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 like I said earlier, it's two really good ways you can. Make your prayer towards your God. You know, you can lay prostrate before your God and send up your prayer. Or you can do like Solomon did. Solomon kneeled on his knees and he raised forth his hand to make his prayer toward this great God. Okay. So, you know, Solomon giving us some good examples of how we can pray to our God. Okay. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6 now. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to deal with the best prayer, in my opinion, that you can make. And that's the Lord's prayer. Because I asked the question, who on this earth can pray better than Jesus himself? I think he offered up the best prayer that ever was made, even mm -hmm. until this day, in my opinion. Okay. Matthew chapter six, pick it up at the five. Go ahead. 
And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. Uh -huh. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily, I say unto you, they have their reward. So the Lord said, don't be as the hypocrites. Because they pray to be seen of men. The Lord ain't impressed with that. Verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Okay, now, I, I want to explain something. In this verse, the Lord is not telling us when we want to make a private prayer to him, that everybody that make a private prayer to him need to go in the closet. He's not really saying that. He just don't want you praying to impress men. Right? Because you want people to see you so they can be impressed with you. You know, and Lord not pleased with that. And so if you're doing it that way, you're not impressing God, okay? You might be impressing men, but you ain't impressing God. And who we need to be trying to impress? The Lord God of Israel, even Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. to the glory of the Father. That's who we need to be trying to impress, okay? They don't have a kingdom to put you in. <laughs> All right. Verse 7. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Mm -hmm. for, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Yeah, like the Lord hard of hearing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he can hear your prayer even if you pray silently. Exactly. You don't have yeah. to utter a word. Just mm -hmm. think it. Mm -hmm. How many times you've prayed and didn't say a word, but you was thinking your prayer to your God. You don't think he can hear it? He can hear that too. And Jesus was giving us plenty of examples of that because they was saying something in their mind, and the Lord told them what they said. He said, I didn't say it. Oh, yes, you did. You were thinking it. All right? So now you don't need to use vain repetition like the Lord is hard of hearing. And a good example of that is not the only example, but another example of vain repetition is how the Catholic Church pray when they re repeat the same thing over and over and over again. You know, the Lord don't like that. And so when we're following uh, the example of Rome, they leading us astray and away from what the Lord is pleased with. All right. We need to be listening to the servants of the true and living God. Servants like Solomon. We need to be following his example. And he's showing us how we can pray. And the Lord Jesus Christ definitely showing us how we can pray, okay? We need to follow their examples, okay? The prayer of Solomon and Jesus. Those are the examples we need to be looking at, okay? Let's go to the eighth verse and read it to the 13th. Go ahead. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things ye have need of uh -huh. before ye ask him. Go ahead. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done mm -hmm. in earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Give us this day our daily bread uh -huh. and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen 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 this is a prayer from a child all the way up into my adulthood i will pray this prayer every day of my life and i will continue to do so okay now i want to point out one other thing we should do uh, before we end our prayer with amen. Okay, put your marker in that Matthew 6 because we're going to be in and out of Matthew chapter 6 throughout the lesson. Okay, let's go to St. John 
chapter 15. St. John chapter 15, we're going to read one verse, verse 16. Go ahead. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Bring forth fruit. He and want that, us to bring forth much fruit. Go ahead. And that your fruit should remain. Mm -hmm. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Mm -hmm. Now, it won't hurt. That's what I'm saying. It won't hurt for us to say in Jesus' name, amen, at the end of our prayer. Because it's in the name of Jesus we have forgiveness of sins, we have deliverance, and we have salvation. Salvation is in the name of Jesus. All right? So it ain't going to hurt you to end your prayer within the name of Jesus. Amen. So be it. That's what amen means. Don't let these Egyptologists try to tell you it's some pagan God name, Amon. Like it's the same thing as amen. We're talking about two different languages, brothers and sisters. And all the nations of the earth may have words that have the same spelling, but they ain't the same uh, uh, word. They have different meanings depending on the language. So when you're talking about the Egyptian language, you're talking about amen or amon, it's not the same as the as amen when you talking about so be it at the end of your prayer. It's two different things. So don't let somebody confuse you because people leave the truth because of little minor things like that. And it's a shame. Okay? Amen. Whatever the Lord talking about, amen. You don't like it, so be it. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Let's go back to uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to do a verse by verse breakdown of the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to begin with verse 9. Matthew chapter 6. It's going to get a little deep now, uh, brothers and sisters. So you got to listen close. Go ahead and read. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Uh -huh. Now, most people think we're supposed to pray to the Son. But the Son is telling you in this verse to pray to the Father. Okay? Now, the latter part of this verse said, hallowed be Thy name. It's the Father's name he's referring to here. Okay? Let's go to Psalms 111th chapter. We're going to go to a couple of places to establish that fact. Psalms 111. Psalms 111. Pick it up at verse 1, and we're going to skip to verse 9. Let's see what the David wrote about that name. Go ahead. Praise ye the Lord. Mm -hmm. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Yes, sir. In the assembly of the upright mm -hmm. and in the congregation. Verse 9. He sent redemption unto his people. He have commanded his covenant forever. Mm -hmm. Holy and reverend is his name. God's name is holy and reverent. And I just don't think no preacher, no minister need to be putting reverent or holy at the end of their name. It's the Father's name that's holy and reverent. Okay? Let's go to St. John chapter 5. Because the Father's holy and reverent name is the name the son came in when he took on flesh and blood. He left from being God, dropped his name, and took his father's name. Okay? 
St. John chapter 5, we're going to read verse 41 through 43. Y'all all right out there? All right, verse 41 and 43. When you get there, go ahead and read. I received not honor from men, but Noah, but, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. Uh -huh. I am come in my father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Okay, so the son didn't come in his own name. So that lets you know Jesus wasn't his own name. Okay? His own name was Jehovah. And we here at the Israel of God understand that perfectly because we've been taught in this church. So we understand that. Okay? Jehovah, the Jehovah Witnesses think that Jehovah is the name of the Father. No, Jehovah is the name of the one that took on flesh and blood and the father never put on flesh and blood. That's why you can read Jesus himself saying, he the true God, talking about the father. Why did Jesus say that? Because when Jesus was in flesh and blood, he had flesh and blood and he said, ain't no good thing in this flesh, right? That's right. Even That's right. though he didn't commit one sin, still he had flesh. Case in point, when you talk about flesh, it get funky, don't it? Well, he wore flesh. That means he had to take some baths, right? Well, Father ain't never wore no flesh. He the one true God. <laughs> okay? I, 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 the Lord Jesus was humble like that. You know, showing us the example. Give honor what well, honor is due. Don't that Bible say that? Pick that back up, um, verse 9. Read that again. Verse 9. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Verse 43, right? 43? Yeah. Okay. I am come in my Father's name, mm -hmm. and ye receive me not. Mm -hmm. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. All right. So the name Jesus, as we know, is the name that the Father gave the Son, Right? And it said, there's no name given among men whereby we must be saved. And that name is Jesus. The father gave him a name that's higher than every name. Mm -hmm. Right? That's right? That the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you believe in the true and living God or not. Every knee going to bow. That's right. Because when the wicked at the time of judgment, they stand eyeball to eyeball with that lake of fire. They're going to bow and ask for mercy. I guarantee you that. And they're going to bow. <laughs> so that wasn't no loose statement when they say every knee going to bow. All right? That at the name of Jesus, <laughs> the name that everybody hating on that don't want to believe. Mm -hmm. That's all right. They're going <laughs> to Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Okay. So we went to that, that was at 43. Let's go back to that Matthew chapter 6. We're going to break down verse 10 now, breaking down the Lord's Prayer. I told you to put your marker there because we're going to be in and out of Matthew chapter 6 throughout the lesson. I need to take my own advice. There we go. All right, pick it up at 10. Go ahead. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, don't confuse the precept of the kingdom that's within you with the precept of the coming kingdom of God. Because we're still waiting on the coming kingdom of God, which is the Father's kingdom. The Lord is talking about the Father's kingdom in this prayer, right? Nevertheless, the son got to come to this earth and take this kingdom from the wicked that's ruling this earth right now. Because the kingdom is here. That's where it's at. That's right. All right. And we're going to deal with that as we continue in this lesson, how you had 
the uh, Gentiles, I think the Hamites, like Nimrod, and they had control of the kingdom. Yeah. Right? Because right. the kingdom is Babylon, right? Of course, the Lord got to clean up Babylon and make it his kingdom, right? That's right. Right? But then you had Israel to some degree, but you had the Gentiles who was ruling the whole entire kingdom. And we talking about this whole earth. That's what we talking about when we talk about the kingdom, okay? So before the Father's kingdom come into play, the Lord got to come and take the kingdom from the wicked that's running it right now and prepare it and get it ready for the Father, okay? And I'm gonna be repeating this continuously he going to be doing this preparing for a thousand years. Okay. So now let's get into it. Let's go to Luke. The first chapter. Let's see what the angel Gabriel said to Mary. Luke chapter 1, pick it up at 26 and read it to the 27. Go ahead. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee mm -hmm. named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Mm -hmm. Skip down to verse 30, read it to 32. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Uh -huh. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Uh -huh. So he shall be called the son of God and God shall give unto him the throne of David. Read verse 33. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Okay, he shall reign over the house of Jacob. And of this kingdom, there should be no end. Let's go to Revelations chapter 13. It was like I stated earlier, before Jesus set up his everlasting kingdom on this earth, the Lord and his resurrected saints got to take the kingdom from the wicked that's running this earth right now. Okay, Revelations chapter 13. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Revelations 13, verse 1. Go ahead. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Okay, now in this verse, the beast, the beast with seven heads and ten horns, they're Europeans, okay? They're Gentile nations who are the descendants of the nations that you're gonna read about as beasts in Daniel's chapter seven. There are they are their descendants, okay? Down through the years, all the way to the coming of the Lord. The descendants of the people that you read about in Daniel 7, when you talk about the four beasts, we read about their descendants. And the reason why we know that, that's why symbolically they have a symbolic, they have the same symbolic makeup of the lion, the bear, the leopard. And in Daniel 7, they call them the terrible beast. And that terrible beast we know represent Rome and the one that's leading Vatican City in Rome. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So now, read verse two. two and read it to the three. Now, read verse, just read verse two. Go ahead. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. You, you see that symbolic makeup right there? 
We're going to read that in Daniel 7 too, okay? We read the leopard, the bear, and a lion, okay? That's what I mean about symbolic makeup. It's going to be the same thing in Daniel 7, and we're going to go there uh, we're going to go there next. But what I want you to do is read uh, verse 2 and 3 again because uh, uh, Satan gave this beast his seat, his power, and great authority. And the reason why he did it, because they took him up on his offer. The same offer that he made Jesus. Remember in Luke, the fourth chapter, mm -hmm. Satan made Jesus that offer. If you will bow down and worship me, it's given unto me to give you all power and authority of this kingdom that he showed the Lord in a moment in time. Mm -hmm. And Jesus told him, get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah. <laughs> okay. He said, I'm going to worship God and him only will I serve. Okay. Right. And this is unfortunately the Gentiles that make up this, uh, 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 these, these beasts that you read in this 13th chapter, they took Satan up on his offer, unfortunately. And that's why they have the power that they have. That's why they have the authority that they have. They're getting it from Satan the devil, you know, and I understand Satan will make that same offer to us. That's right. It might be on a smaller scale, but he'll still make that offer to you. If you bow down and worship him, he'll give you some power. He'll give you some authority. You know. But no, don't take him up because you know the end of the story. Right. So you're going to tell him, I don't think so. Get behind me, Satan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I shall work to God. And him only will I serve. Mm -hmm. Do like your maker do. Just throw it right back in Satan's face. Pow! <laughs> okay. But let's go to that Daniel 7 now. And let's look at, say that. You want me to read 2 and 3 again? Yeah, I'm sorry. Read verse 2 and 3 again. Then we're going to go to Daniel 7. Go ahead. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. Uh-huh and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Uh -huh. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Go ahead. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Uh -huh. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Ain't that what the world doing now? That's right. The whole world is wondering after the beast right now because they looking at the one who got the power and authority. Mm -hmm. In their mind, they don't know they're getting it. He, they getting it from Satan the devil. They don't know that. They're just looking at the riches and the power, you know. And they gravitate to the. That's why the Lord wanted His people to be in power, so that the world can look at His people and say, "I want what y'all got." And then His people was gonna lead them to the truth. Not paganism, you know. That's just natural for flesh to do. We always gravitate to the one who got it going on, don't we? That's just natural for us to do. You know, it's unfortunate, but that's just natural, okay? But now let's go to that uh, Daniel 7. Look at the ancestors of these Gentiles that we read in this 13th chapter with the same symbolic makeup of the lion, the leopard, and the bear. And in Daniel 7, we're talking about the terrible beast, which we know to be wrong, okay? Daniel 7. Read verse 1 and 3. 1, 2, 3. Go ahead. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Mm -hmm. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. Okay, so now as we continue to read, did you read verse three? Not yet. Go ahead, read that three. 
And four great beasts came up from the sea, mm -hmm. diverse one from another. Okay, now these four great beasts are four kingdoms, but every kingdom got kings, don't they? Yeah. Okay. And those kingdoms are, 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 and those kings are ruling the kingdom, which in, includes the whole entire earth. And they ran the whole entire earth in their time. Okay. Read verse four. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked uh -huh. and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. Okay, so the lion that represent Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar was, was, was king of Babylon, okay? That's one head, it's seven heads all together. Verse five. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, arise, devour much flesh. Okay, that's the bear, it's Medo-Persia. That's one head, okay? Verse six. After this, I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Okay, that's the leopard, that's the Greek empire. It had four heads, okay? So you got four heads plus two heads, make six heads. You got one more head, because it's seven all together. Read the next verse. Verse seven, after this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. Uh -huh. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue okay. with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. Uh -huh. And it had 10 horns. This terrible beast represent Rome. And yeah, it was diverse from all the other beasts. Why? Because this Roman beast didn't just destroy you physically. It destroyed you religiously by giving you false doctrine, even until this day, okay? And so right now, we are looking at the ancestors of the ones we are reading about in that Revelation 13, okay? Now, there's seven heads and ten horns that you read in this Daniel's the seventh chapter. They had uh, uh, their their demands in their time, but they dead and gone now. <laughs> okay, so when you go and read to that reading that thirteenth chapter, you know you're reading about the descendants of the same nation of people that you're reading about in this Daniel seventh chapter. That's why you had the same uh, symbolic makeup of the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the terrible beast, which we know to be wrong, and the one that's called the little horn, which is also out of wrong. Okay? Now I want you to read verse 8 also. I don't have it in the lesson, but I want you to read verse 8 also. I considered the horns. And behold, there came up among them another little horn uh -huh. before whom there were the three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. Okay. Now the first, those three horns that this little horn plucked up, the little horn is, is uh, the Pope, right? Out of Rome, right? And the three horns that he plucked up out of Hurali, the Ashrogots, and the Vandals. Mm -hmm. And these are they were German people. That's, that's what they were. They were German people. Now, I want to point something out to you. Down through the generations, all the way into the latter days, even beyond us, you're going to have the beast with seven heads and ten horns, which are the descendants of these same people, right? Germans included. 
All right. So even though three of the uh, Germans who were the hero lie, the Ashwagats and the Van Der were plucked up by the roots, that don't mean that they don't exist no more. How I know that? Because the Germans is over there in Western Europe right now. And Germany is one of the stronger nations of the European common market in our day. So the Germans still exist, sisters and brothers. OK, it's just that at that time, those three that were plucked up, they didn't want to hear what the what, what Papa had to say. And Papa plucked them up by the roots. But they came around. How I know they came around? Because then they have to sign the treaties of Rome. What, ain't Germany, didn't they sign that treaty too? Didn't they sign that treaty too? Yes, because it's the European common market, the 10, right? Mm -hmm. the they had to sign the treaties of Rome. Germany is one of those 10s, brothers and sisters. Okay, y'all got that? Yeah. All right. Now, y'all call Boo and tell him about it. Hopefully it's all good. And he won't say, Jerome, I don't know why you told them people that. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I hope y'all got my back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Now let's go to, uh, that was verse what? It's the middle of eight. That was middle of eight. All right, skip down to verse 16, read it to the 18. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. Uh -huh. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. Uh -huh. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Okay, so the Lord Jesus and his resurrected saints, which we're going to touch on in a minute, they're going to take the kingdom because they got to prepare this kingdom, right? right. Before the Father come, all right? And he's going to be doing that for a thousand years, okay? Let's go to Revelation 20 and look at it. Oh, yeah, that's important. Thank God for good readers. You keep me on point. Appreciate that. We're going to skip down to verse 27. I was just checking to see if it was up there. Because didn't nobody say, Jerome, you forgot to read verse 27. Skip down to verse 27 because I wanted to establish the location of this kingdom. When it said the Lord and we know the saints going to take the kingdom. Where is this kingdom located? That's what we're going to verse 27 for. Go ahead. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, uh -huh. and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So this everlasting kingdom is under the whole heaven, right? So if you think you're part of the 144,000, you ain't going to heaven. You're going to be right down here under the whole heaven. That's where you're going to be. Okay? That's a smack against the Jehovah Witnesses, if y'all didn't know. Okay? <laughs> Revelation 20. Revelation 20. We're going to read one verse, verse 4. Revelation 20, verse 4. Go ahead. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and for which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ, a thousand years. All right. So when they take the kingdom, they going to live and reign. They ruling yeah. with Christ. How long they ruling? A 
thousand years. For a thousand years, they got to get this kingdom ready now, right? They got to get this kingdom ready before the Father's kingdom come, which the Lord was uh, referring to in the Lord's prayer. It's the Father's kingdom he, he referring to, but he got to get it ready first, okay? He going to be doing that for a thousand years, all right? Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. Hold your place in that Revelation 20. We're coming back. Isaiah chapter 11, read verse 4. And um, Brother Jack Moss actually going to read verses 4, 5, and 6. But right now, I just want him, him to read verse 4. Go ahead. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Uh-huh. And the Lord going to have some help in doing this, ain't it? Because we just got through reading where the, uh, he said the saints, right? We're going to reign with him. For a thousand years, and we read in Daniel's where it said the saints took the kingdom, mm -hmm. right? So the Lord ain't the only one gonna have a two-edged sword proceeding from his mouth to slay the wicked. All them saints gonna have a two-edged sword proceeding from their mouth too to slay the wicked. Okay. Go ahead, verse uh five. Five, yeah, five and six. Go ahead. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Uh -huh. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, mm -hmm. and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Uh-huh. A little child shall lead them. Mm. Is that little child uh, flesh and blood? Yeah. This little child is flesh and blood. Are those animals flesh and blood? Yeah. So when the Lord come back, you're going to have a resurrection, aren't you? So the Lord is spirit, but aren't the resurrected saints spirit too? So you're going to have spirit beings and flesh and blood beings living together in the Lord's kingdom, okay? Now I wanna give you a little net nugget about this little child shall lead them, right? During the Lord's thousand year reign, he gonna reinstitute long life again. You know, way back in the day when you read about Enoch and Methuselah and Adam, then they lived to be 700, 900, some odd years old, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Literally lived that long. Yeah. Okay. Because they couldn't live beyond a thousand because of the commandment the Lord gave to Adam and Eve. He said, the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's the day you're going to die. And the day to the Lord is a thousand years. Okay. But at the second coming of the Lord, he's going to reinstitute long life again where you live in a long time okay i want to show you about this little child that's going to lead all right let's go to verse seven nope i want you to go to uh isaiah 65 you read verse six yeah. let's go to isaiah 65 hold your place in this uh in the 11 because we're coming back Isaiah 65, I want you to pick it up at verse 17 and read it to the 22. When you get there, go ahead and read. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. Now in this case, he's talking about the son's kingdom for a thousand years, okay? Go ahead. And the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. Go ahead. But... Be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. Mm -hmm. 
For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. Yeah, because you know right now that is not the case in Jerusalem. Everybody in here know that. Yeah. Go ahead. So this is future. This is at the coming of the Lord, even Jesus Christ. Go ahead. Verse 19. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. Mm -hmm. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Uh-huh. There shall be no more vents and infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. Mm -hmm. For the child shall die a hundred years old. Stop. A child. I wonder, is it the same child that we was reading in the 11th chapter? My point is, the children is flesh and blood. The animals is flesh and blood. But a child is considered a child at 100 years old? You still a child in the eyes of the Lord at 100 years old. Why? Because if you can live to be 900 years old, what's 100? You still a kid. If you can live to be 900 years old, okay? So a child shall lead them? Well, a child can be 100 years old, sisters and brothers, because you can live to be 900 plus. Just can't go beyond 1,000, okay? All right. Finish that. Did you finish that? No, middle of 20. Go ahead. But the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. Go ahead. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. Uh-huh. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. Uh-huh. They shall not build and another inhabit. Uh-huh. They shall not plant and another eat. Uh-huh. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. I, I got a question for the... Uh Listen, audience, have you ever heard of some trees that were real, real old? Can you give me some examples of how old you heard of a tree being? 105. Okay. Okay, well, there are some trees on this earth that's been around way longer than 100 years. Okay. So when the Lord reinstitute long life again, he said, the days of my people are going to be like the days of a tree, or how long a tree exists. And trees, we know some trees in our time that's been around a long time. Okay? All right? But like I said, he going to reinstitute long life again where you can live to be seven, eight hundred, nine, nine hundred years old. Okay? All right, now I told you to hold your place in that uh, 11th chapter, right? Let's go back to that 11th chapter. Pick it up at the seven. I'm gonna speed it up a little bit now, okay? So write the verses down. You can go over it at another time because I still got a lot more that I wanna deal with. Verse seven, pick it up at uh, seven and read it to the 10. Go ahead. And the cow and the bear shall feed, and their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Uh huh. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. And I understand that a child can be anywhere from a, from one, two, three years old to a hundred and still be considered a child. Okay. Go ahead. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Uh -huh. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I want you to remember that. He says, thou shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God, uh, uh, knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Remember sea. Okay. Remember the body of water that's called seeds. In the son's kingdom, you have seeds. Remember that as we continue this lesson. All right. Uh, 10. Excuse me. Do you want me 10? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. Mm -hmm. To it shall the Gentiles seek. Uh huh. And his rest shall be glorious. And his rest shall be glorious. This is the day of rest. 
the thousand year reign of Christ. That's what this is. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. We ain't got to the Father's kingdom yet, which the Lord is talking about in his prayer. All right. We're reading about the Lord getting the kingdom ready to be presented to the Father. Okay. We call it the kingdom of the Son, the Son's kingdom. That's what we call it. Okay. Revelation 20. And pick it up at verse 11, read it to the 12. Go ahead. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. Mm -hmm. And there was found no place for them. Mm -hmm. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. Mm -hmm. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. No, we don't have the book of Revelations in my Bible, so we don't get a judge. We don't get judged according to your works, according to the Bible I read. But according to the Bible that we read, we don't have no problem with the book of Revelations. No. And the book of Revelations says you're going to be judged according to your, your works. works. Okay. Yeah. That was verse 12, verse right? 12. All right, so we know this takes place in the thousand-year reign of Christ. This is the what we call the millennium, okay? The day of rest, all right? Where the Lord and his resurrected saints are going to rule with him for a thousand years. Verse 13 through 15, go ahead. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Uh -huh. And they were judged every man according to their works. Go ahead. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Mm -hmm. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All right. So now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. All that we just read. When that's finished, when it's done, the thousand years of the Lord's reign going to come to a close. All right. When he finished doing all I the Lord got to do, then he ready to present the kingdom to the Father now, which is about that verse we read in the prayer. Thy kingdom come, okay? Talking about the Father's kingdom, all right? Lord got to finish what he got to do. First Corinthians chapter 15, pick it up at the 25. And read it to the 26. Go ahead. For he must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. All right. Then we read that in Revelations where he cast death and hell the in the lake of fire. That's when he accomplished that. That's the last thing he got to do. And once he do that, it's, it's done. I'm done what I'm supposed to do for that thousand years during my reign. Now I'm ready. Mm -hmm. The kingdom is ready now yeah. to be presented to the Father, right? So that point that he made in the prayer could come to pass, mm -hmm. all right? Thy kingdom come, all right? Now let's go back to that Matthew chapter 6. Pick it up at verse 11. We're going to deal with this part of the prayer now. Then we'll come back and deal with the Father's kingdom. Verse 11, go ahead. Give us this day our daily bread. All right, let's skip down to verse 25 and do a brief synopsis of that verse. Go ahead, 25. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat uh -huh. or what ye shall drink, uh -huh. nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than the meat and the body than raiment? So the Lord want us to take that in consideration when we feel like we want to start complaining about what we don't got. All right. Verse 26. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, Yet your heavenly father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Yes. And one of the reasons why the Lord, I know the Lord 
believe that we much better because he didn't give dominion over all the work of his hands to the birds. He gave it to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Skip down to verse 31. Read it to the 33. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Uh -huh. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Uh -huh. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Yeah, so let our will line up with the Lord's will. Yeah. So when we ask the Lord for the things that we desire of our heart, it's lining up with the will of God. Okay? It's lining up with the will of God, you know. And so when we ask for things, he'll give it to us. And if he don't give it to you, serve the Lord. Because he want to give you something more important than you might want for your fleshly desire. He want to make you what? He want to make you him, don't he? Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. What can be compared to that? Absolutely nothing. Yep. Absolutely nothing. And it might not seem like nothing to you now. It's when you draw near to the time where you face to face with decision. Now you see how important decisions are now because you eyeball the eyeball to the lake or salvation on the right side of the kingdom. Now it's real important to you. Make it important to you now. Don't wait till you eyeball the eyeball with it. Okay. That was verse what? 33. All right, I want you to skip up to verse 12. Because now we're getting ready to look at this verse so we can iron this verse out. Verse 12, go ahead. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. All right, so skip down to verse 14. We're going to give a, a detailed synopsis of that verse. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Oh, we, we tend to overlook that verse, but that's the author and the finisher about salvation, giving us the game, as the young people say. He's telling you, if you want forgiveness, you got to forgive. If you want mercy, you got to show mercy. Okay, that's how it works. All right. I want us to go to right into the uh, 18th chapter. Because there's a parable that the Lord gives about someone he forgave. But when it was time for them to reciprocate for someone else that needed their forgiveness, they didn't want to give it. Okay. Matthew chapter 18, pick it up at the 21 and read it to the 22. Go ahead. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Uh -huh. Till seven times. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Ain't no need of you trying to count up to 70 times seven. Yeah, because uh, you'll lose count before you get there. Let's go to uh, verse 23 and read verse 24. Go ahead. Therefore, is the kingdom of heaven like un unto a certain king which would take account of his servants? Uh huh. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Okay, that servant owed 10,000 talents. Keep reading. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children 
and all that he have and payment to be made. Mm -hmm. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Uh -huh. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. All right, so the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and forgave him of all his debt. Now, what did that same servant do when somebody owed him? Keep reading. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. Mm -hmm. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. Oh, my God. You took him by the throat? Saying, pay me that thou owest. Mm. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Now, when he was in that same situation, his Lord had patience and compassion with him and forgave him of his debt, you know. But he didn't have the same um, capacity in his heart to be just as compassionate mm -hmm. when somebody owed him, all right? Keep reading. Verse 30. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. Uh-huh. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Yeah, because I, I like to joke and say, picture this being uh, uh, an Israelite. You know, Israelites can't hold no water. They're going to tell it. <laughs> Go ahead and read. Verse 32. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, mm. I forgave thee all that debt because mm -hmm. thou desirest me. Because uh, thou desirest of me. Go ahead. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Mm -hmm. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors uh -huh. till he should pay all that was due unto him. All of a sudden, your life has changed. And you wondering why. And nobody wanted to attribute it to God, do they? You know, when you have earthquakes and divers places, we don't want to attribute that and say, the devil is doing that. Or the Lord sent it. Right? Can the evil come upon the land and the Lord have not done it? That's what the book say. If he come your way, the Lord sent him. Okay? And this could be some of the reasons why he's sending him. All right. All right. So let's keep going. That was verse what? 34. Keep reading. 35. So likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you. If ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Uh -huh. So likewise, as an example unto us, and we forgive not those that have done us wrong or owe us a debt. 70 times 70. And ain't you you trying to count. Just forgive. Okay. All right. Let's go back to the uh, Matthew 6. Matthew 6. Pick it up at the 13. Go ahead. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh -huh. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, now we're going to deal with the first part of, of this verse. Okay? And then we'll deal with the second part of that verse afterwards. Now, the first part of that verse said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We're going to deal with that part of the verse. Let's go to James, the first chapter. James chapter one, pick it up at the 12. I might have one and four, mm -hmm. but we're not going to do verse one through four. I want you to go straight to verse 12 and read it to the 13. Go ahead. Blessed is the man that endured temptation for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, uh -huh. which the Lord have promised to them that love him. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. 
For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. So the Lord doesn't tempt us. The next verse let us know how we tempted. Go ahead. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust uh -huh. and enticed. Then when lust have conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Mm, so we better stop it, right? Because mm -hmm. the wages of sin is what? So if you continue therein, that's what we're going to get. Okay? Even that lake of fire death. Yeah. You can't get out of that. Okay? Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. We have to seek after righteousness so that the Lord can give us what we need to deliver us out of temptation. 2 Peter chapter 2, pick it up at verse 4, read it to the 8. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 8. Go ahead. For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, mm -hmm. a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Go ahead. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Go ahead. And delivered just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Mm -hmm. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vex his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. For lot was vexed day in and day out living in Sodom. OK, and I can imagine the temptation he went through trying not to co-sign their wicked deeds, just like we being vexed day by day when trying not to co-sign the wickedness that's going on, like the stuff we see on television all the time. They constantly training us and trying to get us to co-sign it, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And ain't it a vexation of your spirit? Yeah. I know it is for me. So I can imagine just lot being vexated with the people in Solomon and Gamora constantly trying to pressure him to co-sign homosexuality in the LGBT ABC one, two, three. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Verse, Verse 9. The Lord know how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Uh-huh. So in time, the Lord did deliver just lot, you know, from that vexation of his spirit being tempted, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. to justify wickedness. He also delivered, delivered just lot and his family from the destruction the Lord brought. On Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. Let's go to Revelations 1. It's in a lot of days, in a lot of time, the inhabitants of this earth is going to deal with a time called the Great Tribulation. Okay. And it's a time of great temptation as well. Okay. Revelations 1. Pick it up at the 10, read it to the 11. Go ahead. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet uh -huh. saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book mm -hmm. and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira, Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Okay, now we, we get this question all the time. Who are those seven churches? You know, and the seven churches represent all churches, down through the generations, all the way down to the coming of the Lord, the ones that know and the ones that don't know. 
when it comes to the truth. Okay? So it's generations that these church, uh, uh, church represent. Whether they be churches that know the truth or do not. That's what these seven churches represent. All of them. All right? All the way to the coming of the Lord. All right? Now let's go read about our church. Even down through the generations. Okay? Go to chapter 3. When I talk about our church, you know, our church consists of believers, okay? Be they Israel, Hamite, European, or the Semitics, right? That's our church, ain't it? Okay, so we talking about the believers now. We know primarily uh, this verse is talking about the children of Israel, though, okay? And those who are taught by Israel, they come and hang out with us, don't they? Because they want the truth from the true and living God. Revelation chapter 3, pick it up at 7, read it to the 9. Go ahead. And unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things said he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that opened it, and no man shut up. Uh-huh. And shut up. And no man open it. Go ahead. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, uh -huh. and no man can shut it. Uh -huh. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Go ahead. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. And who is the worship before thy feet? Who is the thy feet? Is that the children of Israel? Yes, that's the children of Israel. But you got some people out there that's claiming that they Jews, which is one of the tribes of Israel. And the Lord telling you, but they are not. Okay? They do lie. But I'm going to make them know, and I'm going to make the world know that y'all, the natural seed, the children of Israel, they going to Know that I have loved thee. Yeah, I cracked you upside your head, and I'm still cracking you upside your head because you is stiff-necked people. I second that because I'm part of the nation, so, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, the Church of Philadelphia represent the children of Israel down through the generations all the way to the coming of the Lord. Okay? All right. Verse 10. Go ahead. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, mm -hmm. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, mm -hmm. which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Oh, he said the hour of temptation, right? Hearts of men are really going to be tried during this during this hour of temptation. And this hour of temptation is for three and a half years. It's the great tribulation. Mm -hmm. Okay? And we want the Lord to deliver us from this hour of temptation. Let's go right into the 18th chapter. Pick it up at the one, read it to the two. Go ahead. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Uh huh. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Mm -hmm. So we know at the point, a point in time, Babylon the Great is going to fall. And we're talking about the nations that make up the seven heads and the ten horns and the woman, which is the Catholic Church. That's what we're talking about when we talk about Babylon the Great. All right. Skip to verse 9, read it to the 10. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament her. Mm -hmm. when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off 
for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Mm -hmm. So after that hour has expired, Babylon the great is going to be falling, right? The one that Satan gave him his seat, power, and great authority, mm -hmm. all right? Babylon the great shall be destroyed. Verse 17, read it to the 19. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught, mm -hmm. and every shipmaster and all the company in ships and mm -hmm. sailors, and as many as trade by sea stood afar off, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, mm -hmm. saying, what city is like unto this great city? Mm -hmm. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. Mm -hmm. For in one hour she is made desolate. Okay, so they crying and screaming and, and lamenting because we can't celebrate Christmas no more. You know, we can't celebrate Easter no more. We can't celebrate Sunday no more. The merchants ain't making the money no more, so they lament, you know, because it all come out of Babylon the Great, namely from the woman that's, you know, mm -hmm. attached with it, yeah. which is the Catholic Church, even Papa, who run Vatican City over there in Rome, okay? It's his holidays that they celebrate, and they get rich through them holidays, and we all know, you know, but ain't none, ain't none of us, I, 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 I bank it straight, ain't none of us dealing with no real steep debt because we've been buying a whole bunch of Christmas gifts, right? Ain't nobody in here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was verse 17 and uh, 19, right? Correct. Skip up to verse 4, read it to the 5. Go ahead. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, mm -hmm. that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, uh -huh. and God have remembered her iniquities. Uh -huh. So in the Lord's Prayer, we're asking the Lord to deliver us from this evil hour of temptation. And uh, I want to give you an example of that temptation. Uh, during that great tribulation, one of the temptations we're going to be dealing with is when we're not going to be able to buy or sell, say if you have the mark. It's going to be a lot of temptation and in, 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 in telling yourself, I'm not going to take this mark so that I can eat, mm -hmm. feed my kids. It's going to be a lot of temptation to say, I'm not going to take that mark. You all understand that? So during the Great Tribulation, it's a time of temptation because yeah. there's a lot of things you're going to have to not do during that time because you ain't going to be able to buy or sell and you're going to be fleeing for your life trying to get to the wilderness all right you got to consider your family right it's going to be some temptation to not leave some behind isn't it mm -hmm. that, that's going to be a great temptation ain't it because mm -hmm. you love your family right there's going to be a time of great temptation too, sisters and brothers. We want the Lord to deliver that, deliver us from that evil hour of temptation, okay? All right. Let's go back to the uh, six, Matthew 6. We're almost there. Matthew 6 and 13. We're going to deal with the, the uh, last half of that verse. Go ahead when you get it. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. So the last part is, for thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. Amen. That's the part we're going to deal with next. Go to Revelations 20. And we're going to pick it up at verse 14, read it to the 15. Go ahead. 
and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Mm -hmm. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, so Jesus must reign for a thousand years to take care of this business, right? That's right. And when he finished taking care of this business, right, then that thousand year reign gonna come to a close. The day of rest gonna come to a close, right? Now it's time for the Father's kingdom because he going it's ready now and he's gonna present it to the Father. And then you're gonna be dealing with the Father's kingdom, mm -hmm. right? Right. That's when you're gonna be dealing with the Father's kingdom. Go right into chapter 21. Right into chapter 21. Read verse one and two. Go ahead. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. But well, we read in uh, Isaiah, the 11th chapter, where there were seas in the son's kingdom, didn't it? Mm -hmm. He said, from sea to sea, didn't it? My rest shall be glorious, mm -hmm. right? In the father's kingdom, ain't no sea. I'm not going to debate about the river and the oceans. I'm just letting you know it ain't going to be no seas. I'm just going to tell you what the book say. We can debate about that another time, but it won't be no seeds. <laughs> that I know. <laughs> okay. yeah. Verse three and four. Go ahead. Verse four. Uh, you read yeah. verse one and two. Oh, no, I you read, read verse one. Verse one. Read verse two. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Yeah, so New Jerusalem. The Father's house of many mansions, right? That's right. That takes place in the Father's kingdom, all right? It was prepared for you from the foundation of the earth, wasn't it? It was prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Read verse 3 and 4. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, uh -huh. and he will dwell with them, uh -huh. and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Go ahead. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, mm -hmm. for the former things are passed away. All right, so in the son's kingdom, mankind live long lives, right? We showed you a child, be 100 years old and still be considered a child, right? You had animals, flesh and blood, and the ch children was leading the animals, right? That's in the son's kingdom, right? They flesh and blood, because you got spirit beings and flesh and blood beings in the son's kingdom, right? 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 But in the father's kingdom, no flesh and blood, right? And, uh, and, and flesh and blood die. But if there ain't no more death, there ain't going to be no more flesh and blood, because flesh and blood is what die, yep. right? Read, uh, skip down to verse 10. Go ahead. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, uh -huh. descending out of heaven from God, uh -huh. and having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, uh -huh. even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Go ahead. And had the wall great and high, and had 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So each of the 12 gates of the Father's house of many mansions, it had the 12 tribes of the children of Israel written on them. So if you want to go through the pearly gates, yeah. if you want to walk on the street of gold, you got to go through Israel, all right? And I like to add, Jesus is an Israelite. He's of the tribe of Judah, and one of them gates going to have written on it, Judah, okay? Amen. Let's go right to the 21st. Skip, skip to the verse. 21, read it to the 22. Go ahead. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. 
and the street of the city was pure gold, mm. as it were transparent glass. Go ahead. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. All right. So the Son's kingdom will have a temple in it. According to Ezekiel 41, verse 1 through 4. Just write that down. We're not going to go there. All right. But the Father's kingdom won't have a temple because Jesus, the Son, and Jesus, the Father, are the temple. Okay. All right. Keep reading. Verse 23. And the city had no need of the sun, mm -mm. neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, mm -hmm. and the Lamb is the light thereof. Go ahead. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Mm -hmm. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Go ahead. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, mm -hmm. for there shall be no night there. Go ahead. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Go ahead. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defile it, neither whatsoever work it abomination or make it a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Mm -hmm. So we understand that the Lord, when he finished doing all he had to do during his thousand year reign, we understand that it's prepared now, it's ready to be presented to the Father. I don't got that verse in the lesson. We could go there quickly, and then I'll end the lesson there, right? So let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And let's pick it up at verse 24. First Corinthians 15, verse 24. When you get there, go ahead and read. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Amen. 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 So in the Lord's prayer, in regards to the Father, thy kingdom come. And then he said, for thy kingdom is the power and the glory forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. May the Lord have a blessed to the reading of his word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.